is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan, and this is episode 185, covering the week of September 2nd through September 6th, 2019. Glad to have you back in the program. Very glad to be here. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Abbeville Institute. Like our Facebook page at Abbeville Institute. And, of course, subscribe to our YouTube page at Abbeville Institute. If you don't want to find all those social media buttons, just go to our webpage, abbevilleinstitute.org. At the top of the page, you'll find all our social media buttons. You'll also find our Amazon Smile button. If you want to contribute to the Institute while you shop at Amazon.com, just click on that and make us your preferred nonprofit organization, and you'll throw a few pennies our way when you're doing that. If you want to support the Institute otherwise, you go to abbevilleinstitute.org. Give us an email address. We'll give you a free ebook. You'll also get our daily dose of Dixie. Dix, excuse me, daily dose of Dixie. If I can speak today, Monday through Friday, and our weekly email on Saturday or Sunday, which includes a link to this podcast. You'll also see at that website there's a tab at the top of the page that says support. Click on that. You'll see donor options. You can donate monthly, annually, or give a one-time gift. All of that does support our mission to help explore what is true and valuable in the Southern tradition. And, of course, it is tax-deductible to the full extent of the law. So you might want to consider doing that if you like what we do. You like our website. You like the podcast. You like our conferences. We have uh, another project we're working on that's going to be really neat, and we hope that you'll contribute to that as well. So a lot of great stuff that's going on, and, of course, everything you do does help us in our mission. Also, don't forget to share a material out on social media. If you like those things, uh, share it on uh, Facebook, Twitter, wherever you uh, you engage. Send it emails. If you do get our emails, uh, forward them around to your friends. Use the tools at your disposal to help expand our mission as well. You can do all those things. And again, that stuff is just painless, just hitting a like or a forward. All that stuff is great. You can also get our mobile app so you can have the Abbeville Institute on the go. That is also Free of charge, just go out to your application store on your mobile device, look for Abbeville Institute, you've got our app, and uh, we just uploaded all of our summer school lectures, so all of those are up there now, uh, so you can get those, uh, again, free of charge. All this stuff is free, so if you want to help us keep these things free, please consider a donation. And of course, you can always get your Abbeville Institute apparel by going to abbevilleinstitute.org. At the top of the page, you'll see a tab that says support. Again, click on that, there's a shop tab and click on that and it'll take you out to our great embroidered apparel. Lots of great ways to support the Institute and show that you support what we do by advertising with our apparel, by sharing our material. So please do all those things. Uh, We cannot exist without your generous contributions. We can also not exist without your support. So the more you do, the more that we can do. So um, let's talk about the material we have for this week. It's a lot of great stuff. And I'm going to focus on three pieces. Um, And one of them I'm going to start with because there was some discussion, at least sent to me, uh, about this piece. People were confused about this one and how it fit with the mission of the Abbeville Institute. So let me explain because um, I think it fits perfectly with what our mission is. And that is Norman Black's piece on secession hypocrisy that we published on Thursday. Now, tell me if I'm wrong, but if you support the Southern tradition... And you're inevitably going to start coming up with ways to support uh, the efforts of the South in 1861 to secede from the United States. So if you support that, people are going to tell you you're a traitor. People are going to tell you that you're not in line with with American principles because you're a bad guy. Now, we know that this was generally the Union position in 1861. We know that the Union, people in the Union were calling Southerners traitors at that time. We know this was going on, but we also know that no one was ever prosecuted and convicted of treason following the war. So if that's the case, look, the Southern tradition then comes down to this idea of political independence. We can we can talk about the causes of that independence. Why did Southern states want to secede? That's a whole other issue than the legal issue of is that if they could actually do it. Right? So we can separate these two things out. Just like we can separate secession from the war. We can say that secession is one thing, the war is another. So when we talk about what caused the war, well, what caused the war is that Lincoln wanted to stop secession. He wanted to prevent the independence of the southern states. That's what caused the war. I mean, nothing else caused it. Lincoln made that very clear, and this was not something that uh, he, he wasn't going to war for some moral crusade. 
It was simply because he wanted to prevent secession. So secession, in many ways, is at the heart of what we consider to be the Southern tradition today. And we know that American, the American tradition has very much been pro-political independence, self-determination. I mean, the United States is built on that very idea, right? So you, you look at the American War for Independence. This is what it was. It was a, an, a, an independence movement for the 13 states that were in North British North America. They wanted their independence, all of which, by the way, were slaveholding states, a fact that people conveniently forget. And even when people say, well, but they were fighting for, I mean, the British said that they were fighting for slavery. I mean, this was clear in New York and Virginia. They tried to make it the main issue. So we have political independence at the heart of what it means to be an American. And then the South, and we know that over time, you had various political independence movements in the United States. As early as 1794, Northerners are saying, hey, look, we need to get out of this thing. Rufus King and Oliver Ellsworth were John, to John Taylor of Caroline. We need to get out of the Union. We know there's a political independence movement in New England in 1800, 1801, 1803, 1815, the Hartford Convention, 1415. We know this went on. We know that abolitionists wanted to secede from the Union in the 1840s. So we know that at the heart of American political tradition is self-determination. And Northerners were fine with it too. And so were Southerners. But then when it actually happens in 1861, and there were other cases, of course, where the South started advocating it at other times. But when it finally happens in 1861, you have the North saying, you can't do that. So Norman Black's piece, Secession Hypocrisy, is to show that the United States government has been hypocritical at times in its application of American principles, and that American principle is self-determination. It has supported it in certain cases and not supported it in others. And this is to show that uh, the Southern tradition, the, the prevention of secession in 1861 is just another example of Northern or United States hypocrisy on the issue of self-determination. It's why it fits with the mission of the Abbeville Institute to help explore what's true and valuable in the Southern tradition. Southerners, if they want to follow the Southern tradition to its core, would be fine with self-determination movements anywhere because, of course, that is at the heart of what became the southern part of the Southern tradition. You cannot get around the fact that that four-year independence movement has become so ingrained in the Southern tradition. We can say all Americans supported self-determination before that, I mean, at various times. But the South did it again, and that has become part of their identity. So Southern identity has been driven in many ways by decentralization by secession, by the charges of treason, by the charges of, uh, you know, un-American. You're un-American if you don't support top-down central government. It's un-American. So when Norman Black goes out and writes a piece about it and says, well, here's how the United States has been hypocritical other places, sometimes we support self-determination. Sometimes people say, we got to fight for people's, oppressed peoples all the world, self-determination. Oops, unless it disagrees with our policy and what we're trying to do in these areas. Then we don't support self-determination. One of the examples he gave, of course, is the most recent independence movement in Spain, the Catalonian independence movement, which we've talked about on this podcast before, which has now essentially been crushed militarily. The United States was silent on it. If it was truly interested in its founding principles, it would have been all over self-determination there. All over it. Because, of course, the United States has long been interested in fostering... Uh, Self-determination in cases where it thinks it can gain headway for doing so. This is where, or gain benefit from doing so. This is where self-determination is where the United States has been completely hypocritical. It wasn't going to allow for the South to secede, but yet it would support, for example, the secession of the states from the Soviet Union, and rightly so. But would it support today secession of California if the people of California wanted it? It didn't support Catalonian independence because the United States is so tied up in Spain, we can't. That would be uh, going against one of our neighbors, so to speak, one of our allies. And that's just not going to happen. Um, so this is interesting how the United... And I think this is, a, this is a worthwhile piece in that particular way. It's a worthwhile piece because it examines 
the fundamental problems with American foreign policy, the fundamental problem with this pro-Lincolnian view of the world and also of the United States, which is really where you get that. If the United States could just pick a side, we're going to be against self-determination. Well, then you are saying that you're against the entire creation of the United States. So you can't do that. So if you're going to say you're Lincolnian, you say, well, I mean, we, we can only be for certain things. We could support it. But Lincoln would say that you, you can't. So w- you can't have this halfway house, right? Either got to be one side or the other. And American history would dictate that you cannot be against self-determination anywhere in the world. And right now, Americans are looking at we're for a Hong Kong self-determination. We're, I mean, we're, we're for that people. Rise up against the state. Rise up against the central. Stick it to the man. Would they say the same thing if the people of California wanted out or the people of Vermont wanted out or the people of Hawaii or the people of Alaska or the people of Alabama? Would they say the same thing? No, they wouldn't. Would they say the same thing if there was an independence movement in a place that's an ally of the United States? where uh, it was not maybe not a communist government there, but people just simply wanted to exercise self-determination. We, we see how this works with Brexit, for example. Some people in the U.S. are for it. Some people are completely against Brexit. You can't do that. You've got to have this European Union. You signed up for it, so you got to get it. Ridiculous. That's why the piece, and I, again, so I'm answering these critics that send emails that I get saying, well, I think this is, a, this is against the Abbeville Institute mission. How so? How so? Uh, it fits perfectly with what uh, Dr. Livingston established as the Abbeville Institute's mission and what he focused on for years. We do other things as well, but this has long been part of the fabric of the Institute, exploring this political decentralization. One of the books that Dr. Livingston loves to give to people or instruct people to read is, uh, uh, the, uh, is Davis a Traitor by Albert Taylor Bledsoe which is a, a book about secession, right? Or Abel Upshur's book on the Constitution. These are about secession. They're about decentralization. That's at the core of what the Southern tradition has become, resistance to central authority. So it fits perfectly with that in explaining American hypocrisy and how America at times will do the right thing, but other times if its interests are in, in the way, it won't. And the war in 1861 is a perfect example of American hypocrisy. So it fits perfectly. Now, with all that said, we can talk about what the Southern tradition is, what so, the Southern political tradition is, what, how that fits within America and these other two pieces. So these other two pieces, we... Let me, let me go back. Before I get to those, we'll talk about the two that I'm not going to spend much time on. The poem by David Biddleton. One of the things we do like to do at the Abbeville Institute is promote Southern culture and literature. And This poet's an original poem by David Middleton, one of our scholars who was, uh, used to teach at Nichols State in Louisiana. Um, he is uh, a great poet, uh, someone who is very much interested in maintaining, keeping alive that Southern literary tradition. Um, something that is so important for um, for the fabric of what makes the South, what makes the Southern people unique. It's something that you know, music, literature, art, these are things that comprise a culture. And so that culture of the South, that, that Southern literary culture is important. Uh, you know, people love Southern literature, and rightly so, because Southerners have a story to tell. So this is part of it. It's a great poem about uh, the war between the dreams and um, it's an excellent piece of, of literature. Um, and then we had the piece on Friday, which is, uh, again, another driving through Virginia car tour, you know, driving tour by Brett Moffat from Tennessee. He, he likes to, tra- he likes to travel and he wants to get people to see some of the things that, that make again, the South an interesting and unique place to live and visit. Um, there is so much to see in the South. You don't have to go anywhere else to see some really unique things and interesting things. And so it's a lot of fun to read these. And I've actually learned some things that I didn't know, uh, you know, a couple of places here and there that I, I didn't think about or that I wasn't aware of that you could go do. Uh, so these are great little tour guides by someone that you can trust and say, hey, these are good sites to see. These are good things to see. Uh, and you should take your time to do it. Maybe some off the beaten path a little bit but certainly well worth your time 
and energy and effort. If you're in the in the eastern shore area of Virginia or in the tidewater of Virginia, I don't think he's uh, he does the tidewater in this particular uh, installment. He hasn't gotten to the eastern shore yet, I don't believe. Uh, but um, he he definitely is someone who is. Uh, uh, a, a good source for what you should see in these areas. He's got several of these driving through. Uh, he's got driving through Dixie, driving through Virginia. He's going to do more of these. So this is a nice uh, continuing installment uh, series uh, that has to do with Southern culture and history and tradition. So we do those things, but we also do the political stuff. And one of the things that um, I like about the pieces on Monday and Tuesday, they work well together. The first is a lecture by John Devaney at our last summer school. And again, reiterating, all of these lectures are now available through our application. They're also available on the website as well if you want to get them. Just go to that Lectures tab at the top of the page. Uh, audio, I think it says Audio Video. Uh, just click on the lectures and you can get the series of lectures. The Summer School series is there, all 14 of the lectures. Uh, we've got them in the app too, so go out and get those. Soon to be at some point in the near future on video that we'll have them on YouTube as well so you can watch them. Uh, but... We have uh, this piece on populism. Now, this is a confusing term, and I think it's one that uh, people have, of course, are discussing quite a lot now because of Donald Trump. And they're saying, well, what is populism? I mean, is Donald Trump a populist? What is he? And, of course, that phrase has been used quite often in the comparison with Andrew Jackson and uh, the fact that uh, you know we have this, uh, this outsider image and Trump appealing to the people directly and, you know, you are going to do this and these type of things and we're going to do this for the people. Um, and so this has been seen as problematic uh, because Trump has been portrayed as a demagogue, a dictator, a tyrant. Look, Donald Trump is no more of those things than anyone else who's been the executive office in the last half century. Uh, Obama was the exact same way. Obama was wielding the exact same powers that Trump has. It's just that the left, which controls a monopoly on the media, has not let Trump get away with anything. In their mind, would they let Obama get away with all kinds of things because he was doing things they liked. This is what Calhoun pointed out, and we'll get to Calhoun in a minute. This is what Calhoun pointed out, the problem with the American system, the problem with written constitutions. When the one side's out of power, they try to ensure that we keep tight controls on the Constitution, and when they're in power, they don't really care about that Constitution anymore. That is a fundamental flaw in America, which is why you wanted to have the concurrent majority and these type of things. So uh, that's Calhoun. This is why we should study Calhoun. But uh, Devaney gets into this idea of populism, what it is. And you know, the, the question is, populism and progressivism are often confused. They have some similarities. But populism was not a was not a forward-thinking ideology. It was a reactionary conservative ideology. And it's not really even ideology. It's a tradition. So when you look at William Jennings Bryan in 1896, and he gives this very famous cross of gold speech, and he says farmers essentially have been nailed to a cross of gold. The imagery there was of Christian people uh, in, in that time, at that time in 1896, you're looking at a, an American population that is dominated by Christianity. And these farmers, many of them, it doesn't matter where they were, in the South, the Midwest, wherever they were, in the West, in the United States, were predominantly fundamentalist Christian. So that image of a crucified farmer nailed to a cross of gold, gold being the problem, being the moneyed class, this is seen as populist. What did the farmers actually want? What they wanted was what farmers had wanted since the beginning of the Federal Republic. They were opposed to the Hamiltonian system. You see, this is what's lost in all this. Really, populism in America, American populism, is Jeffersonianism. That's all it is. It's Jeffersonianism. It's the idea that the central authority should be restrained that it should stay out of the banking business, that it should stay out of promoting commerce and industry and finance, and that farmers should be able to farm and rural people should be able to be rural people, and that workers should be able to work, and they shouldn't be beaten down by the money class, by the establishment, by the bankers. So it's, Je it's John Taylor of Caroline, it's Thomas Jefferson, it's the old Republicans. These are the populists. It's at least the ideological underpinnings of the populists. 
which in many ways is just old English country views. You have decentralization. Now, farmers at times wanted things out of the central authority, and I think that was where the bargain was cut in the 1850s, when you get the Republican Party, and then you see the split in the late 19th century, when you get the Republican Party, and you look at that early Republican Party, it's it's a, an uneasy coalition of Western farmers who didn't want slavery in the territories, who didn't want blacks in the territories whatsoever. Uh, you want to talk about the pro-white group of people, it's that first Republican Party. And the New England and Mid-Atlantic bankers, industrialists who wanted the Hamiltonian system. And they cut the deal, and what they gave the farmers was free Western land and internal improvements. They gave them these things so that uh, they would vote for the Republican Party. And, of course, they were going to keep slavery out of the territories. Well, once the war is over and you start seeing some of the things happening to the American economy, and most importantly, this this effort to foist the Hamiltonian system on the rest of the United States, the farmers thought, oops, wait a second here. We cut a bad deal. We don't really like this money class that's running everything. We don't really like these Hamiltonians. We're Jeffersonians. So that's where populism came from. And that populist strain has carried forward in many different ways. It's manifested itself in many different ways in American politics. But certainly... It's, it's strongest in the South and uh, also, you know, it, for a time in the Midwest and the West. But in the West, a lot of Westerners are actually Southerners who moved out there. Uh, but really, I mean, this is what we're talking about with American populism. Now, you know, you have some populists who, who tend towards socialism and other things. But certainly um, that idea of Jeffersonian political economy is part and parcel of populism. So when you look at that and then you look at where American conservatism is going, and that's the piece on uh, Tuesday, it's an old book review of a Eugene Genovese book, The Southern Tradition. Uh, and this is a wonderful little book. If you've not read it, it's very important. It's, it's, one of the, it's one of those seminal books that everyone should read on the South. And it was written in the 1990s. And um, it take seriously people like Mel Bradford and others who were critical of America from a Southern standpoint. And they were basically echoing the Jeffersonian tradition, which can be considered to be populist, right? I mean, this is what they're doing. It's not really populist, it's Jeffersonian. And so the what's going on here and what the author of this piece brings up is that it's okay to embrace markets. It's okay to say these things are great. It's okay to support uh, American manufacturing, whatever it is. But that has limits. This is exactly what Tucker Carlson was saying and got so much heat for when he said, look, I mean, there has to be a humane side to these things. Markets are great, but they're not the only thing. Uh, and this is what the populists were constantly pointing out. Land is the basis of these things. We have to have independent farmers. We have to have free people. We have to have a, mor a moral society. Uh, and you cannot just have uh, winner take all and uh, people abusing people. There has to be some restraint on that. So essentially what Calhoun and other conservatives, Southern conservatives would say is that there is a necessity for positive legislation at the local level and the state level more than anything else to try to affect those changes. Uh, the, the states had to reflect the communities that they represented. The states could serve as a hedge against unconstitutional legislation. The states were the building blocks of the entire system. That is Southern conservatism. That's important. So it's important to understand how all these, all these dynamics work. It's important to understand, you know, populism, its foundation, its foundation is Southern. Real American conservatism is John Taylor, uh, I'm sorry, is, uh, is John Randolph of Roanoke, you can say John Taylor too, John Randolph of Roanoke and John C. Calhoun. Russell Kirk pointed that out. And I think Kirk admired Calhoun and Randolph because they reflected a real American, a American brand of conservatism. When you move forward, as the South is defeated, all of that's gone. And Kirk even brings that up in the conservative mind. He says, well, look, after the war is over, the South is too concerned about defending itself. It really can't lend to the national conversation, so to speak. And because it's always being attacked, it's always defensive, it cannot flower. 
That is the great travesty of American conservatism. Calhoun should be respected by every American conservative in the United States. But he's not. And he's not because of the Straussians, the Jaffaites, the Lincolnian spirit. That's why he's not respected. Because as soon as you say Calhoun, well, Calhoun's not American because he was for slavery. Um, that means Thomas Jefferson was an American. I mean, that means you can take your pick of a, of a host of Southerners in the founding generation who weren't American. This is a stupid cop out, and it's actually falling in line with the left. They're just they're, they want to fend off the charge of well, I mean, you support a, a racist. Well, I mean, if you support Abraham Lincoln, you support a racist, right? If, if you support George Washington, you support a racist. All these people are racist. Does that make their ideas on government society incorrect? Um, if we can separate those things, does that doesn't can we not find value in that? That's the whole point of the Abbeville Institute to find value in what these people said, exclusive of the things that we would say in the 21st century are not what we want to do, right? So Calhoun's value should be actually championed by the left, too. Calhoun was pointing out problems of society, problems of political power, which comes down centralization. It comes down to the core of American conservatism. Centralization is bad. Uh, and that is the that is the American political tradition on the right. Centralization is bad. So if we don't want that, we should all be listening to Calhoun. If you're on the left and you don't like what's happening with the Trump administration, you should be saying you should be all over Calhoun. Look what Calhoun says. This is I mean, this is somebody who's important, but they can't because they can't get out of their own SJW way to say that somebody might have some value, but he may not agree with them on other things. But these are valuable things. So this is why the Southern tradition is the most important component of America. It applies, I mean, look, populists are often considered leftists in some ways because they're against this monster Hamiltonian system that was created. I mean, they're against central banking. When you had the Occupy Wall Street movement, these people were right on in some ways, but they were a little bit deluded. I mean, they're thinking this is Marxist. In reality, what they're trying to do is just be Jeff good Jeffersonians. Some of them were real Marxists, of course, and they're problematic. But really what they want to do is just be good Jeffersonians. That's the whole point, right? Jefferson would have been for uh, a, a re, a, abolishing the Fed. Jefferson would have been for curtailing central banking in the United States. He would have. John Taylor, more importantly. But so would the Jeffersonians, the, the old Republicans. It's all unconstitutional. They would have been for, they would have been against, for example, Trump's tariff. Trump, uh, Trump's tariff is unconstitutional. Trump can't force a tariff on anyone. That has to come from Congress. But of course, Congress is doing nothing. Why? Because Calhoun said they would do nothing. Because Calhoun said they would punt their responsibility over and over again, and we would get executive government. This is the problem, right? Calhoun is so prescient, so important that uh, he should be, again, considered to be one of the most important political thinkers of the day. And if we had real conservatives in America, he would be. The problem is, of course, the social issues when you get in that you people just can't get get over themselves and say, well, you know, I mean, yeah, I get, we don't we don't agree with him on that. But look at these things he's saying about power. Look how important that is. I mean, do we say the same thing about Jefferson? Jefferson's notes on the state of Virginia is has got a uh, very racist sentiment in it. Okay. Uh, but, I mean, Jefferson said some really important things, right? So let's talk about those things because clearly we don't support those other things. So let's talk about these things. So this is, this is where uh, you know, we need to be consistent and where the South could offer something to America. The Southern tradition could offer something to America at large, not just for the South itself, but for America at large. But we have to be able to, we have to, be able to study these things uh, logically study these things, also dispassionately study these things from a way that we're not getting, letting our emotions get involved. I mean, that is, emotivism is a great curse as well, uh, that uh, that you cannot study Calhoun if you're going to be unmotivist, if you're going to just feel everything. You know, you, I feel these, I feel that, and you can't do that. It just, it's not going to work. So these three pieces actually do work very well together. Again, John Devaney's lecture is now available, so if you want to listen to the lecture rather than reading the piece, you can do that. Uh, but his, his, uh, the lecture is a little different than the piece itself uh, because he just worked off of notes for the lecture and the piece he actually wrote out and thought about some things. So they are a little different. 
Um, but regardless, um, this is a, a great primer on Southern populism, which of course is really just Southern conservatism, as is pointed out in the piece on Eugene Genovese and what you know Mel Bradford would have said, what the what the agrarians would have said. That's what we're talking about, and that idea of secession has become, or decentralization has become part and parcel of the Southern tradition, which is why it's so important to point out U.S. hypocrisy on the issue. Until next time, good day. Good day.